Hi, everyone. I didn't realize I was going to be following uh, Irvin Welsh, so I better match up. Uh, are you all having a good uh, festival? Yeah. Good, good. Did you see Public Enemy last night, anybody? Yeah. yeah, good. Okay, that's the pleasantries out of the way. So um, uh, my, t- my uh, presentation, the problem with the play pump. So uh, a central question I'm asking in my presentation is what does uh, innovation look like? How do we recognize it? How do we tell what it is? And the example I'm choosing to illustrate this question is a South African invention called the play pump. Uh, The play pump is a children's roundabout that pumps water to a storage tank. Uh, The storage tank has advertising billboards on it, and the rental of the billboards uh, is intended to fund the maintenance of uh, of the pump. So it's presented as a sustainable system where money for uh, maintenance is generated, children play, and the idea is you get water almost as a free byproduct. Uh, So this uh, was invented in South Africa mid-90s. It's really started to capture the attention of the international press in the early 2000s. Uh, You have titles, the headlines like the drought-busting magic roundabout, Sunday Times. You also had BBC, New York Times, National Geographic all picking up on this amazing sort of story that the play pump uh, represents. It's often called magic, like a kind of a magical object. Uh, This was a very influential short film by PBS uh, about the play pump, uh, 2005, turning water into child's play. Child's play is another phrase that you see associated with the play pump a lot. So this got to a very wide audience, and people in Europe and America started wanting to help fund the play pump. One Water started selling bottled water where the funds went to the play pump, so you started to get this big... Uh, European and American audience for the play pump in South Africa. And uh, Play Pumps International was set up as the international uh, fundraising wing of uh, play pumps. They started to take donations through their website. It was set up by former AOL founders, so they knew a lot about creating new websites for taking donations. Uh, and it really started to uh, you know, gather steam, the project. This is the height of the play pump's fame, a promise of $60 million to roll out 4,000 play pumps to supply water to 10 million people in Africa. Uh, And you can see the famous faces in uh, in this uh, photograph, Bill Clinton, Laura Bush, and the chasers of AOL. Then, 2009, this journalist, uh, he did a basic calculation. Uh, He said, uh, what are the daily water needs of 2,500 people it's meant to supply? And how many hours of play on the uh, roundabout would it take to satisfy those people's daily water needs? So 27 hours a day. So there was clearly something that was uh, not quite right with the play pump. And uh, people weren't happy with it. A couple of reports that had been previously suppressed came out, that UNICEF had done. And they said adults were really unhappy with play pumps. Uh, this, is, this is because children couldn't play in it enough time in a day to meet the community's needs. So adults would end up turning the roundabout by hand. And the roundabout isn't really designed in that way. What people prefer is the hand pumps they had before, which are designed for one person to use. So you have a a very, you know, an undignified process for women at the end of the day having to turn this children's roundabout by hand. One of the reasons why the pump uh, doesn't perform very well and why it's quite hard to turn is because the pump is hidden inside the roundabout. So to be able to create the seamless appearance of the magic roundabout, uh, the pump is hidden and therefore it's constricted, so it doesn't really work very well. That's why it can't meet the water needs of all of those people. Also, the elevated water tank, if there's no water stored in the tank, then the person who wants water has to pump the water all the way up to the tank and then down to the faucet at the other side. So the play pump is harder for uh, someone to use in that way than an ordinary hand pump. What you'll notice about both of those features is that the things that make the play pump really exciting and a good story, the roundabout, the elevated water tank, actually make it harder for the user to use the play pump. So it's not good for the user, but it is good for audiences. It's good as storytelling. Ultimately, what we're being sold with the play pump is a story, a story of child's play producing a a daily necessity um, and uh, taps into ideas that we have about phrases like child's play, Magic. There's a long history of magical objects that can do our work for us. This is Mickey Mouse in Fantasia as the Sorcerer's Apprentice. He bewitches this broom to do his work for him, and it doesn't end well. But taps into powerful mythologies that we have. So I think um, in the end, the people who had play pumps said they wanted their hand pumps back again. This is a Zimbabwe bush pump. It's a very ordinary hand pump. It's actually had lots of innovation over several decades to produce this pump. But you can't really tell from the outside, from pump to pump. It all takes place internally in the mechanism of the pump. So if we ask, what does innovation look like again? 
I think we need to acknowledge that sometimes what appears to be innovation is actually good storytelling, and it's not necessarily what's good for the user of the technology. Um, so the, the, the play pump is actually one of the exhibits on an exhibition coming up at the Science Gallery, Surface Tension, the Future of Water, which I'm helping to curate. So I hope you'll come check out the exhibition at the Science Gallery and uh, find out more about the play pump and other objects. So thank you very much. Thanks to the Science Gallery team.